During his time on earth, Jesus Christ established the one true church. But just over a hundred years later, the church vanished. Learn what happened to God's church during the lost century next on The Key of David with Gerald Flurry. Greetings, everyone. In Matthew 16, verse 18, it says that, or Christ said that this, His church would never die. And uh, sometimes it came close to that, but it never did die. So where is it? Where is it today? Most people in this world don't realize and are, I think, blinded to the, to the fact of how much the true church of God has been persecuted over the centuries. Today I want to talk to you about the lost century, a lost, the lost century in the history of the true church of God. If you look in your Bible, it'll be, it's called the little flock, and uh, it's been the little flock uh, to a large part because of the persecution in this world. God's own people have been actually martyred over the years, many years, thousands of years, because of their obedience to the Bible and to God's truth. But just imagine this. If you can go back in history, and you can certainly find this, where for 100 years the history of God's church is just blotted out. And then at the time when, uh, well, it went into that blackout, it came out a very different church. So let me read you a quote from Herbert W. Armstrong who wrote about this in his book, The Incredible Human Potential. Here's what he said, Thereupon this Simon Magus appropriated the name of Christ, calling his Babylonian mystery religion Christianity. Satan moved this man and used him as an instrument to persecute and uh, all but destroy the true Church of God. Before the end of the first century, probably A.D. 70, he managed to suppress the message Christ had brought from God. There ensued the lost century, the lost century in the history of the true Church of God. There was a well-organized conspiracy to blot out all record of church history during that period. A hundred years later, history reveals a Christianity utterly unlike the church Christ founded. That is a, a terrible time in the history of the true church of God. He concludes by saying it had taken the name of Christ and applied it to the Babylonian mystery religion. It had replaced the message Jesus brought from God with a gospel about the person of Christ proclaiming the messenger, but suppressing the entire missing dimension from his message." Now that's explained clearly in Matthew 24, verses 3 through 5. So Mr. Armstrong said, you've got this period from A.D. 70 to A.D. 170, where the history of the true church, secular history, is just blotted out. Now, how, how would Christ respond to that? What is He going to do in a case like that? What is His reaction? Well, we need to see what the Bible says about that, but if you look at even secular sources like the German theological school talked about the obscure century in church history. They can see that, and they wrote that this violent contest was going on between two Gospels. Some wanted the Gospel of Christ, which means the same Gospel Christ preached, the Gospel of the Kingdom, and others wanted a Gospel about Christ. Well, what do you think happened? You can read other historians like the great Edward Gibbon, and he'll tell you also that about this 100 years where the history of the true Church of God, or the Church of God as he understood it, uh, was blotted out. It went in with these doctrines and came out, well, with very different doctrines. What happened? Well, you can, I'll read you just a little of uh, what it says in Matthew 24, verses 3 through 5. Uh, the disciples came to Christ and asked Him about when the these things would come to pass, and what shall be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceives you. 
For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Well, how would they do that? Well, they come talking about the messenger, but they don't give you his message. And that has been the great deception. You see, that change was made during those 100 years, as far as the public is concerned, and that's essentially what happened. It went into those 100 years talking about the message of Jesus Christ, came out of those 100 years talking about the personality of Christ, or, as, or the messenger, and not the message. Now that changed everything in the, well, the course of the history of God's church and uh, the history of false Christianity in the world. Christ prophesied exactly what would happen. Now I can remember, if I go back in the history of the church, I remember Herb W. Armstrong said that, talked about that lost century, and it really was uh, sort of electrified the whole congregation because they'd never heard that before. They didn't, or at least most of them, didn't understand it. I certainly didn't. And, uh, and you, you, in other words, you can go to secular history books, and, and it, it's just, there's no history of the true church of God. So, uh, what is God going to do to uh, rectify that? Well, God took several books, three, three uh, books, really, of the Apostle John, and, and put that history in those books, specifically in the epistles, but also some important history in also in the Gospel of John and in the book of Revelation, John wrote all of those books, very critical books, some of the most critical books in the Bible. Uh, after Mr. Armstrong died, I began to look around to find that quote where he had said that, and I had my notes, and in my notes I wrote, the church history in the world just disappeared, destroyed all records in the world. One place John recorded it is in his three letters. Also, some of it is in the Gospel of John and some in the book of Revelation, but specifically most of it's right in the epistles. As far as the history is concerned, God recorded it there and recorded a lot more that this world is unaware of, and that vacuum of 100 years was just filled with some of the most powerful prophecy and truth in your Bible. There was a, uh, what you, we could call a spiritual trilogy or a biblical trilogy of some of the most powerful writing in your Bible. Now, let me read you what uh, another quote from a member inside uh, Herbert W. Armstrong's church at that time, uh, shortly, well, a decade or two before Mr. Armstrong died, and here's what he wrote. This is by Ernest Martin. Dr. Ernest Martin, he said, the period from A.D. 70 to 170 has become known as the lost century. As far as New Testament history goes, God has preserved the central history in the pages of the Bible. And I had to go on later, and, and, and I looked closely in the church that uh, Mr. Armstrong was in, and the church that uh, followed his, and even in uh, the one that followed his, I found that it, there, it was difficult to find that history. It seems like there is a lot of uh, rebellion against that truth. And there is a, so many people prone to, well, do away with that history. And, and we're going to see that a lot of people in God's own church did just that in a terrible, terrible way. God talks about in that sixth era the Philadelphia era, Revelation 3, that there is a synagogue of Satan right inside the church that was trying to blot out some of that history as well. Some of God's own people. Hard to believe, but that's certainly what has happened. It shows you how deadly Satan's power is. Here is another quote that I want to give you. Before the end of the first century, the persecution had reduced the true church. Mr. Armstrong wrote, Many members had gone out of the true church by A.D. 90s 
1 John 2 and verse 19, John was warning the brethren against the false ministers. 1 John 2 and verse 4 and 2 John verse 7 and 10. Soon the false counterfeit church greatly outnumbered them. So we, if we look at that history closely, we can see that John wrote all three of his books in the period of uh, 85 to 90 A.D., and that's in that 100-year period. So the uh, people had blotted out the history of God's true church in the secular history, but God preserved it in John's writings. He was there at the time warning everybody of what was happening, and it's all a type of what is coming upon us in this end times. It's all prophecy for today. John kept talking about the last hour was upon them, and he thought everything was coming to an end. But he was really talking about the time we're living in right now. That's what he was talking about, because it's prophecy for this time, and then John later in Revelation learned that he God had not revealed to him the truth about when this was actually going to happen. But he did just a little later. Now let me give you one more quick quote in this booklet on the uh, true history of the true church. Uh, I wrote, John was battling that great satanic conspiracy. People rose up in the church and began kicking out those who were loyal to John and truly following God. I mean, they were, not only did they kick them out, in some cases, those people were martyred in the very church of God at the time of John, in that 100-year period, and in many other periods later on. God's people have been brutally persecuted throughout history, in some cases unbelievably barbaric kind of persecution. We have here the lost century. And uh, John wrote his epistles, the epistles of John. He wrote the book of Revelation. He wrote the gospel of John. And it, and it filled that vacuum that, we're, that I'm talking about in a way that is so powerful and so moving that if you look at all of those three books and study them carefully, I, I will tell you that I think it will strongly change the course of your life. There is just so much in those three books, and God's inspired so much because of what was happening in the church at that time. They were literally blotting out the history of God and killing God's people. And God put, all, uh, put just an abundance of His wonderful truth in that very 100-year period. You would benefit greatly just to read that. Let me give you just a little information from the, the epistles of John to begin with. And I'll just read 1 John 2 and verse 18. It says, this is from the Revised Standard Version, Children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard, that Antichrist is coming. So now many Antichrists have come, therefore we know that it is the last hour. This is a sign that tells you you're in the last hour. You have to know who these Antichrists are and who that Antichrist is. There was a man, one man, leading some of God's people in God's church, most of God's people today, 95% of them away from God in the last hour. When you see that happening, you know we're in the last hour. We have for years thought that this would all happen outside the church, but lo and behold, it started right in the church. And this is specific history that John wrote and warned those people about because they had their Antichrist back then. It was probably uh, Diotrephes, I think. At least he's a very prominent man at that time. But there's a different one in this end time, in this last hour. Again, in my uh, last hour booklet, I wrote this. In the last hour, Antichrist appeared on the scene. People who knew God, the Father, then turned away and are now fighting Christ. The problem began with that Antichrist, singular, but then there were many Antichrists, numerous dissenting groups from the Mother Church. That all, again, was prophesied by John in the epistles. See, only John wrote about the last hour, and only John wrote about the Antichrist. That is unique to John. 
He was living through all of that in that period of time of the history of the true church of God, but it was all just a type of what's coming upon us in this end time, and the very same thing has already happened within the church of God, the true church of God. And this booklet on the last hour will explain that to you in a very powerful way. So will uh, the uh, other books that I mentioned here today. But if you want to know when we're in the last hour, you're going to have to know this history that I'm talking to you about. It reveals where we are in Bible prophecy. And if you study these three large booklets I'm going to offer you today on our program, let me tell you, it has to have a great impact on your life if you're open-minded about this message. 1 John 2 and verse 19 says, They went out from us, right out from the church. So if there's a, an Antichrist and people fighting against Christ, there has to be a little flock there who's fighting for Christ. Anciently, in that 100-year period, that lost century, and today in this end time. The history is right here in the Bible, and God made sure He gave not only some history about the true church of God in that period, but He gave so much truth that it's, it's absolutely some of the most exciting and wonderful truth in the entire Bible, and those are three of the greatest books in the Bible. And there's a reason why. Look, one of them's Revelation. That has all of the time frame of all prophecy throughout the entire Bible. How important is that book? John wrote it while he was in prison on the Isle of Patmos in that 100 year period, in that lost century. You talk about God really uh, just flooding uh, the church. It was in, in a kind of a deluge of truth in that 100 year period, even though it was being blotted out in the history books of this world. Now that's amazing understanding as far as I'm concerned, and everybody needs to know that and needs to understand how people can be persecuted just for obeying the truth of God in their Bibles. Astounding truth. And then 3 John 9 and verse 10 talks about uh, the people being cast out of the church. If you go to the book of Revelation, again, that was written in about A.D. 90, and uh, notice what it says in uh, Revelation 1 and verse 9. Let's look at this book. It also tells you what was happening in that 100 year period. This is verse 9, I, John, who am also your brother and companion in tribulation, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. In other words, he was there because he was preaching the word of God, teaching the word of God, and he was the last apostle to be alive. Peter had been killed shortly before that, and all of the other apostles martyred because they obeyed the very truth I'm talking to you about today. Isn't that astounding? And how many people really know that and really uh, are aware of what went on at this time? Here's uh, some history that we all need to know and understand. Now, it took uh, the growth of the first era of God's church at that time, the Ephesus era, the, uh, this will all be explained to you in our booklets, but uh, in 30 years, just 30 years' time, uh, they, the, the work stopped growing, and they did, weren't preaching it around the world anymore. And these are the people that were, some of them were right there with Jesus Christ and were able to touch Him and speak to Him and talk to Him. When He was on this earth, they, they were right there with Him, and yet in 30 years, the uh, message had already stopped from going around the world. They weren't doing their part in, in some ways, at that time certainly. They lost their first love, God says. They lost their first love. They weren't really excited about the wonderful truth of God like they used to be. And that is a danger that uh, we can all be facing uh, if we're not careful. And, and really retain that excitement and not lose that first love. 
the Apostle John didn't lose his first love, and all of those apostles didn't lose their first love, even if they had to give their own lives, they didn't lose their first love. I'll just quickly tell you a little about John's gospel. Let me give you a quote here. In my book, I said this, John the Apostle was a deeply spiritual man and had an unusually close relationship with Jesus Christ. And it talks about John being the one that Christ loved, and they'd be off uh, talking to each other quite often. And probably John got to know Christ better than anybody else because Christ was preparing him for that 100-year period and, and other problems he would be facing. After Peter was dead, Peter was a leader in the church until he was martyred, and then John became the leader of the church of God. In verse 1 of chapter 1, here's what it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now John is pointing out about the Word, the two gods, God and the Word, before they became God, or the Father and the Son, which is explained here in John 1. And the Westcott Commentary says, In the Synoptic Gospels there is no direct statement of the pre-existence of Christ. Here John in this book is telling us about the, the whole history of God, going back to the time when there were no angels, and there, were, there was no universe, and there were no, no men or, and women on this earth, because there was no earth, of course, either. Then verse 2, the same was in the beginning with God. It means He was with Him for all eternity. They, they were walking together. There was never any rebellion, any dis- vital or let's say violent disagreement between God and the Word. They were totally at one. And that's what God is trying to teach the world today. And He taught John this wonderful truth deeply, and then John t- teaches it to us. And oh, how we need to understand this, how this world is so divided and violent and hateful toward each other, and they murder each other, they kill each other, they war. It's just a way of life in this world. And yet God and the Word set the example for all eternity of how to love each other and get along. And He's about to teach it to mankind, too, after they've suffered enough that they'll finally repent and get to know God. They don't know Him. Jesus Christ said in verse 18 that He came to this earth to declare His Father. He he came to declare the family of God, or the kingdom of God, that we can be born into. He opened up the family of God to billions of sons if we're just eager to receive it, and we'll have that first love and continue that first love and and make sure it grows. All of this was given to John in that lost century. What a wonderful blessing, and what a wonderful response of God to that persecution then. How can you even describe all that? And how can you not be thankful for it? No book explains God's love like the Gospel of John, the deep and wonderful love of God. If you get into these three large booklets, I'm telling you, they will change the course of your life. Until next week, this is Gerald Flurry. Goodbye, friends. Request Gerald Flurry's book, The Last Hour, to learn about the powerful vision that sustained John's spiritual life. Also request Daniel Unlock's Revelation and John's Gospel, The Love of God. All our literature is available free of charge at no cost or obligation to you. Order now. The preceding program was a paid presentation of The Key of David, brought to you by the Philadelphia Church of God.